Christian nationalism, it's understood to be the belief or the position that a government and a society should be governed by certain principles, certain perspectives that are attributed to Christianity. And in that, Christian nationalists believe that policies from the federal government all the way through the local government should reflect these values, these beliefs, these positions that they attribute to Christianity. Now, if you asked mainline people, if major Christian leaders who were not part of this uh, Christian nationalist movement, they'll tell you that Christian nationalism isn't Christian at all. It doesn't follow the teachings of Jesus. They, Christian nationalists really don't want to be bothered with what Jesus actually said. Instead, they're really focused on a political agenda and they wrap that political agenda in Christian sounding words. Christian nationalism is indeed a problem today in the United States. It is prevalent in the government, federally, locally, in the courts, and it's shaping a lot of life in the United States. Today, I'm not going to try to explain all of Christian nationalism in the United States or do an expose on that. Instead, I want to look more broadly at Christian nationalism because it's not new. It's not something we've talked about as commonly as we do now, but it's nothing new. And as I talk about this, I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel as well as to click the bell so you're notified of future videos. In Russia, Putin's regime is intrinsically a Christian nationalist regime. It's different from what we find in the United States, but Putin has intertwined his politics with the Russian Orthodox Church, and one of his primary spokespeople is Patriarch Kirill. So that throughout the Russian Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church is supporting the policies and positions taken by Putin. This has been so significant that in Ukraine, where the Russian Orthodox Church existed for a very long time, the Russian Orthodox Church was outlawed. Now, there are still Ukrainian Orthodox churches, but Russian Orthodox churches and Ukrainian churches existed side by side. In the current war, the Russian churches were outlawed because they were places, hotbeds, for Putin's rhetoric. And so to limit that, they were outlawed in the country and people moved to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church exclusively. What Putin did is nothing new. Hitler did the same thing. In World War II, Hitler designated what were called Protestant Reich churches. These were churches that were mouthpieces for Hitler's propaganda for his beliefs about a pure race and a, a certain take on German history and why he was the one chosen to restore the glory of Germany. And these churches really functioned in that way to really be sources of indoctrination, beginning with youth groups all the way through elder care. And, you know, there were other churches in Germany but they were not necessarily represented or designated as Reich churches, but it was the Protestant Reich churches that worked hand in hand with Hitler to change society. So it was a very insidious process. This process has happened throughout history, and we know the great calamities that happened throughout history between the various inquisitions and the crusades and the way uh, Jewish people were removed from various European countries. All of that was part of Christian nationalism. But it's important to realize that the actual foundation of Christianity as an institution is rooted in Christian nationalism. For the first 200 years, and I've talked about this in other videos, for the first 200 years, the followers of Jesus referred to themselves as people of Israel. They were followers of Jesus. Jesus was Jewish. They considered themselves as part of the people of Israel, whether they were Jewish 
or whether they were Gentile. Their actual background didn't matter, but they were followers of Jesus, the followers of the Messiah. The first people to call the followers of Jesus Christian were the Romans. That was their designation from the Roman Empire. In 313, Emperor Constantine I really began to co-opt Christianity. He made Christianity not only legal and tolerable, but made it the official religion of the empire. And as that progressed, he oversaw the development of doctrines and creeds and instituted Christianity in a way that to be a good citizen of Rome, to be part of the Roman Empire, required that you follow the Christian religion. And in time, if you did not follow and profess the Christian religion, then you were not just outside of Rome, but you may be killed for your lack of belief. So that political power and religion became intertwined. Christian nationalism. It's insidious. It's gone on throughout the history of Christianity, where rulers have taken Christianity or things that sound Christian and made them part of their political agenda. They've become the veneer of their political agenda. You know, Thomas Jefferson was a great student of religion and history. He's a brilliant man. Yes, he had his faults. But one of the things he really understood from his reading of history was that there was a need for a wall of separation between church and state. And that was the phrase he used in his writing, a wall of separation, because he understood that when church and state become intertwined, it's trouble, that it becomes a way of co-opting society. And so he really worked against that. Similarly, we need today to recognize Christian nationalism for what it is and to recognize that the enemy of Christian nationalism is diversity of belief and opinion. That the various opinions, beliefs that we have really work to counter Christian nationalism. So we need to claim what those beliefs are and to speak them clearly. And that's true whether we are people of faith or people of no particular faith. That's not the point here. Instead, what is important is that we take a clear stand to say that, no, this blending of, of belief and state and, re and religion and government has no place here. That somebody's religious interpretation should not be determining what books are in a public library, because it's public, that our school systems should be welcome to all children and provide benefit to all of them, and that the laws of the land should reflect the wealth of the country. One of the things that's important to realize is that Christian nationalism in itself is very regressive. It can harm us economically, and it can harm us internationally in terms of our standing in the world. And many other commentators have, have addressed these issues. So they're out of my field, so I'm not gonna go into them, but suggest if you're interested to dig into those things. Instead, what I want to encourage today is to take a clear stand against Christian nationalism and to do that by living a life that is faithful to the values that you have and being open and honest about those values, especially in public settings. Be sure to subscribe to this channel, like the video, share it with others, leave me some comments, and always know that I appreciate the time you spend with the videos on Spirituality Beyond Borders. Have a really great day.